Hi, I'm Tim Holsgrove, and I'm a senior lecturer in biomechanics and bioengineering at the University of Exeter. And today I'm going to be talking about the Exeter hip stem. So first off, when I started mechanical engineering, I didn't really know um, what it involved particularly, other than it used the physics and mathematics that I'd enjoyed at school. But through my degree, I realized that design and problem solving are at the heart of engineering. And as I went through my degree, I became more and more interested in applying that to medical problems. And that's allowed me to look at uh, things like injury and degeneration, such as the injury that can occur in the spine, and also the structure of the intervertebral disc and the way that that, that changes due to loading and aging. And then also looking at the design and evaluation of medical devices. And that can include things like fracture plates, which are used um, to fix fractures. And some of you may have these or know someone that has one. And then also screws and rods that are used in the spine. And again, this can be used in the case of fractures and trauma, or also to uh, treat spinal deformities such as scoliosis. And it's also involved, allowed me to get involved in the design and uh, evaluation of joint replacements. And that includes things like uh, this knee replacement. And so you can see on this, we have a, a component that will fit into the, the tibia and then a component that fits into the femur. And then that allows it to rotate in the same way that a normal knee would. And then also a hip replacement like this. But before I go into more detail about the design of a hip replacement, I'm going to talk about the hip as a whole. So when I stand on one leg, have a think about the force that's going through my hip. Most people I ask this to would say something like 80% of my body weight. But in actual fact, it's about 300%. Uh, and so every time I stand on one leg, there's about three times my body weight going through my hip joint. And that's because in order to stand on one leg, I have my body weight which passes through my center of gravity here. And in order to prevent my hips from rotating, I need to use my muscles to stabilize it. And that's similar to the way that you might balance a seesaw. But because the distance from my muscles to my hip joint is less than the distance from the hip joint to the center of gravity, the force from the muscle must be greater. And that's what leads to this um, big increase in the force that goes through the hip. And that's just standing on one leg. And that occurs every time you walk. And if you take 10,000 steps a day, that's going to lead to just under 2 million cycles per year on each hip. And that's just walking. The forces that go through the hip when you're doing other activities, such as running, jumping, or carrying loads, can be much, much higher. And so you can see that there's, there's high loads going through the hip and you have to go through a lot of cycles. Um, and the other thing to consider in the hip and bone and the musculoskeletal system as a whole is Wolf's Law. And this states that healthy bone will adapt to the loads it's subjected to. And a simple way of thinking about this is that you have to either use it or lose it. And the same way you might train your muscles to get stronger and if you stop training, your muscles will reduce in size and become weaker. The same occurs with bone. If you load it a lot, it will adapt and the bone density will increase. But if you don't load it, either through inactivity or through activities that aren't weight bearing, the bone uh, density will reduce. And this is a big problem for astronauts who spend significant periods of time uh, in a microgravity environment where the skeleton isn't loaded nearly as much as it is on Earth. But the other important thing about Wolf's Law is the, is the microstructure of the bone. So bones adapt to the specific loads that they're um, subjected to. So the hip joint and the microstructure of the bone within the hip joint will be very specific to the loads that go through the hip. And so if you put an implant into that, it can change those loads and that can lead to a change in the structure, which can be quite bad for the bone. And so if you think about a hip replacement, um, it's got to deal with these high loads, a large number of cycles, and so metals are quite often used for hip replacement components. But these are much, much stiffer than bone. 
And so putting them into the bone can affect the way that the loads are transferred. And it can mean that some areas of the bone aren't loaded as much as they are in the natural joint. And this is called stress shielding. And what this means is that the, the bone or the, that area of bone is shielded from the normal stresses and strains that it would be subjected to. And because the, the structure of bone adapts to be efficient and reduce where it's not needed and increase where it is needed, that means that if you stress shield, you could end up with areas of bone disappearing. And that can lead to uh, poor outcomes and a need for revision surgery in the future. So if you think back to what I said about engineering and the core of, of engineering being design and problem solving, you'll hopefully see that, that the requirements and constraints involved in joint replacements mean that it's incredibly challenging to design a, a successful uh, hip replacement. Now this hip replacement uh, involves several components. So we have the hip stem, uh, which fits into the femur. And this one is stainless steel and it would be cemented into place with bone cement. And then on top of that, uh, there'd be a ball in a similar way that there's a, a ball at the top of your, your femur. And this one's made of, of ceramic. And then into your pelvis, you'd have the, the cup of the joint. So it's a ball and cup or ball and socket. Uh, and this one is titanium, uh, titanium shell with then a polyethylene liner. And that basically now works to allow your hip replacement to move and work in the same way that your natural hip would. And the reason you have a ceramic head and a polyethylene liner is so that the, the coefficient of friction between these articulating surfaces is very low and that reduces wear that occurs during those, num those high number of cycles that the hip will have to go through. And these kind of components um, are used in many hip replacements and it's an incredibly successful procedure. Um, so after about 10 years, only about 5% would need revising. Uh, but about 100,000 are, are carried out in the UK every year. And so even a small improvement in performance can be a positive, uh, can have a positive effect on thousands of patients. Um, now the Exeter hip, which is this, uh, this is the Exeter stem. Um, this was designed uh, in 1969 by Clive Lee, who was an academic uh, in the engineering department at the University of Exeter, uh, and Robin Ling, who was an orthopedic surgeon at the Princess Elizabeth Orthopedic Hospital, which is now part of the Royal Devon and Exeter Hospital. Uh, and it was first implanted in, 19, in November in 1970. And in the 50 years, or just over 50 years that followed, it's now the most successful cemented hip stem in the world. Uh, and over 2 million have been implanted worldwide. Um, and the reason this is such a successful hip stem uh, is really due to three reasons. The first is the uh, double tapered uh, shape. And that double taper is basically to do with the fact that it tapers down in this view when looked at from the front. And then it also tapers down when looking at it from the side. Secondly is the highly polished surface finish. And then thirdly is the fact that it's fixed into place using bone cement. So those three things are, are what's behind the success of the implant. And the reason that is, is because as the, loads, as the, the hip is, is loaded through this ball, the taper works like a taper lock. So as you load it, it will sl subside slightly. So it will move down into the femur and that engages the taper and leads to it fitting tighter. And that's the same as a wedge that being forced into a gap. And the more you force it in, the tighter it'll get. And the polished surface finish allows that to happen more easily in the same way that it's easier to slide a smooth object along a surface compared to a similar object with a rough finish. And then finally, the cement. And this is really important because being stainless steel, this is much stiffer than bone. And so there's a potential that that can alter the way that loads are transferred through the bone and it could lead to that stress shielding issue. But because the bone cement is less stiff than the bone 
as the stem's loaded and it subsides into the cement. What that does is it allows the load to be evenly distributed from the stem through the cement and into the bone, and that minimizes the stress shielding that can occur. And so that's why it works so well. So the design of the stem is really about, it's not just one thing that makes it good. It's a number of different factors coming together. Um, and designing implants like this requires an understanding of all those different factors and how they'll be affected and how they'll work when they fit into the body. And it also requires collaborating with people from different areas of expertise, like engineers and surgeons. And that's why it can be so interesting to work in this field because of those collaborations and because of the different expertise that are required to get successful implants to work. Uh, and so I hope you found this interesting and thank you for listening.